And then we do some really fun things, which are half weeks. So a couple times a year, we actually get together and the teams do whatever they want. And they gang up with different groups and work on different problems, explore new technologies. We have one coming up soon. And we're super excited about that process. And it's, it's a fun fun way to both explore new technologies or go solve problems that you want to have a chance to solve, but even focus on other things. And we're growing. So we've been growing really fast. Um, and we have a lot of openings, so I couldn't pass up this opportunity. Um, having you all in the room to think about that. These are just some of the positions we have open, largely the tech, but there's also business and marketing positions and sales. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this. So the Friends of Zillow. So even if you're not readily whatever you're up to, if you're a friend and you bring them to us, um, we'll give you a bonus. Um, this is our Friends of Zillow program that we um, we just uh, have been trying out and it's been really successful for us. So think of yourself, if you know someone who might be that person, then you can either talk to one of our recruiters or standing over here and they'll be here tonight, or send a, send a note to this email after alias, boz at zillow.com, and um, we can get that process going. And welcome, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the program. Thanks a lot. <laughs> TechBridge is a, not, a national nonprofit organization, and we're based in Oakland. We've been there for 15 years, but we just started in Seattle. This is just our second um, academic year here. So our mission is to inspire girls to change the world through science, technology, and engineering. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but I think most of you have seen this. There's not very many women. The number of women getting CS degrees has actually declined, blah, blah. So I'm not going to go into this because I think that's boring and you probably mostly have heard it a lot. Um, what I'd rather tell you about, so here's our mission statement again, is what we do in Seattle. So the main thing we do in Seattle so far is that we have after school and summer programming for girls. Um, we cover a wide range of, as I said, science, technology, and engineering topics. So we have a, a computer science unit, we have an electrical engineering unit, lots of different topics. Um, the key things that are relevant for you are to know that we the program runs all year long. It's once a week. Um, we train corporate role models to come in and talk to the girls to be role models for our girls. Um, we do a lot of family events, um, lots of family engagement, and we do field trips with corporate partners and with universities and community colleges. So um, that's what we're doing here in Seattle. We've just started. We're in eight schools, and I should have said earlier we only we exclusively serve high needs schools. So we're in eight uh, schools in the Highline School District, which is down by SeaTac Airport. We're in five elementary schools and three middle schools. If you are interested, I will leave my contact information. I'll leave some cards here with our buddies from recruiting. What do you need? I'm sorry. Oh, what do we need? So we're looking for volunteers, role models. Um, women especially in STEM fields, but we do absolutely encourage men uh, volunteers as well. Um, some of you may have seen a Google study that came out in 2014 saying that anyone can encourage a girl's interest in computer science, uh, regardless of their background, technical background. Um, and so we absolutely have male volunteers and welcome that, and so we're looking for people who want to be role models, or if your companies are interested in hosting field trips, um, uh, please come talk to me. Thank you. All right. Next up is uh, our first and only lightning talk, Brandon Ashton. He's going to talk about the uh, AOS Lambda, and um, it sounds like a fun uh, little demo. That looks good. Yeah, I'll do it again. Hey, Lee! Hey, Lee! 
reboot the server. Bring the Zilla method. How many of you know what AWS Lambda is? Some of you. So the short of it is, it's supposed to be this cool service where you upload a script that does something, and then you make requests to it, and you get stuff back. It sounds kind of like a web service, but it, the whole idea is that you don't have to think about any of the infrastructure around it. You kind of say, I have this much resources allocated when it spins up, and then they bill you for the amount of time that it actually is doing what you want it to do which can be really useful if you've got things that are like really bursty traffic that happens every so often, you don't want to really be like, oh, I'm going to spin up the server and wait for it to come up and down as traffic comes in, it just kind of goes. Um, so I put together kind of a little demo for that that I thought would be interesting. Since the whole Star Wars thing is going on right now, it's a little face recognition service where you, uh, you upload a photo and then it tells you which Star Wars character you look like. Uh, so that seemed like a good use of it. So it was kind of interesting because it's got OpenCV and some other stuff all wrapped up in this little package and then Python talking to it. So this is actually, this little handler thing is the core of it. You have an event that comes in in a context, don't worry so much about the context right now, but I supply a file and then I process the file, I go fetch some stuff that's off in S3 to actually, it's kind of the, the model um, that it uses to process against, and then um, I have to do a little bit of magic here because uh, a little further down because Lambda is not great if you actually need uh, libraries that are compiled for the system and not just regular Python libraries. I kind of figured that out while I was working on this, and getting OpenCV to work on this was not fun. But the short of it is, if I can navigate this with one hand, all right. This is getting to be a very small screen with all of this. Um, I'm going to, I have a folder, which I think I closed, fortunately. Um, uh, with a bunch of images of various people here, <laughs> and we will find out. Which Star Wars character they actually are? You have Jump on the Heart. Uh, I don't. He really. So I had to get a bunch of test images for all this. So I so I used the Google search API to then scrape 100 top photos from all these. Um, that's not always the best way to find uh, data to fill in, but that's what we're working with. Um, there's some confusion about whether or not Amy Shoemaker is C3PO. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So we send off these pictures and then we just start getting them back. So the first time is actually a little slow because this hasn't been run for a while. Um, it's actually kind of like priming up the servers. You run it <laughs> more, it will go faster the next time around. And we can actually then hit it with a lot. It's still a little slow this time. It's actually running like a fairly bad image processing algorithm in the background. So <laughs> this normally takes few seconds on my machine to process each one of these. So, so yeah, this is kind of the, the way that works. It knows how tall Dusty is. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so we can do this. We can send off a large amount of jobs, and it just kind of just doesn't really care. So like, I've got this little thing. We can send 10 copies of all of these photos off, and it will, uh, they're all going to be back fairly quickly. So yeah, that's the gist of it. Um, I'm going to put in a little bit of a plug for the API meetup next week. Um, we're going to wrap this in a web app. It also just kind of is a static web app, and you'll be able to upload your picture to it and find out who you are. Do we know the date for that meetup? Um, I think it's next Tuesday. Tuesday at Moth. Tuesday at Moth. Yeah. Yeah, right down the street. Yeah. So, yeah. And uh, 
If you want to know more about my adventures with this, just ask me during the break. is somebody that I think a lot of people in the audience are probably familiar with. Uh, if you've taken a class at Code Fellows or at Utah for the, uh, I don't know the exact name for it, if you've taken a Python course at Utah or at Code Fellows, uh, there's a good chance that Chris Ewing was your teacher. Uh, I think there's like a lot of people in here that have been uh, uh, students. So what's that? Show yeah, show your hands if you, if you, know, if you were a yeah, student at Chris Ewing. There we go. A lot of people. Oh, and so, yeah, oh good. Yeah, so you have a familiar audience. Few friendly folks in yeah. the audience. Uh, other than that, Chris Hume was also our Educator of the Year on our first anniversary meetup. He won a Raspberry Pi for that. Woo! -hoo. Woo! Have you used it? Have you used uh, it? We're working on it. My yeah, son and I are, okay, my son and I are learning good. Python now, so that we can. So that we can. Oh, you need to prepare for the future. Right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. good. All right. You're up. Oh sweet. Cool. <laughs> Yay! All I have to do is actually successfully log into this machine. Password is shaky fingers. There we go. Okay. Wow, this is a big old screen. Okay. Don't stare at it. You know what I really want to do though? Uh, is set this up so that I can get the. That's a funny way to spell iPhone. What's that? Funny way to spell iPhone. <laughs> Okay, let's see if this actually works here. Which one do you get? <laughs> so I'm either about to show you all of my speaker notes and, and embarrass myself horribly, or, or this will work out correctly. Oh, yes, first time out, okay. So um, thank you all for coming tonight. I, I'm, I'm happy to see some friendly faces out there. My name is Chris, uh, you, you've been introduced to me now, and I'm here tonight to talk to you all about Clone Five. It's the latest release of the uh, Python content management system. It's been around for quite some time now. Um, I have a little bit of stuff about myself, but it's kind of uh, moved now that Alan's giving me such nice introduction. <laughs> I, I, I am, in addition to being a, an instructor at Code Fellows and at the University of Washington, I also do uh, independent web development here in town uh, and work with a couple of people in this room on projects um, and enjoy that aspect of my life very much. I've been involved with Plum for a long time now. Uh, I got started in 2006, the year that the Plum Conference was actually held here in Seattle. At the time, I was working for the University of Washington uh, for the Department of Radiology. They had about 15 websites scattered out across a large number of servers and all kinds of different systems. And they in instituted a project to try and figure out how to bring all these websites together into one container so that they could manage everything from one place. We looked at 10 or 15 different systems at the time, and Plone was the one that we landed on. The, the, the main reason for this, or the main reasons for this, being that the workflow that Plone had allowed us to really compartmentalize the content that was in the website and allow people who should be able to edit things to edit the things they should, and to deny them the right to edit the things that they should not. It also had an outstanding security model, and since we were putting sensitive financial information, all sorts of uh, you know, primary investigators for big grants were putting their budget information up in this and managing it through the, the clone site, we didn't want to let that kind of stuff leak out. So that was another reason that we enjoyed it. And, Finally, the fact that Plone was so easy to use on the front end for people who were going to be creating and managing content was a really big driver for us. I don't know if any of you have ever worked with like a large, really non-technical crowd on a web project, but if you try to get people who've never like really used a web content management system before to, to make content and to manage that content over time, you have to make it as easy as possible. Otherwise, they just won't do it and all the stuff in your site gets stale and old and out of date really quickly. <laughs> exactly, like SharePoint, precisely. So the Plone was a, th a thing that we really dived into in 2006. It, it, it served us very well over the years. But tonight I'm not going to talk about like the feature set or, or anything like that. I'm, I'm going to wear a couple of different hats this evening. The first one is going to be that of the historian, the famous historian. I'm going to tell you a little bit about where Plone <laughs> comes from. Uh, then I'm going to put on my techie hat, and I'll talk to you for a little while about some of the technical development of the software that runs underneath Clone, the things that make it actually work. And then finally, 
I'm going to dress up as a salesman and come at you with a little bit of information about why Plum might be the right tool for you and why you might actually be interested in participating in the community that is Plum. We hope at the end to convince at least a few of you to become part of the patchwork that is the Plum community. But in kicking this off, I want you all to think back to the early days of the internet. That's you know a pretty decent place back, but I, I, I want to go further back. Let's let's take it a little further back. That's 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 getting there. But really, I want you to go back to the dawn of the internet, way back. <laughs> this guy right here is Jim Fulton, and in 1996, he's the CEO of a company in Virginia called Digital Creations, and he's on a plane flying across the country to the International Python Conference. He's scheduled to give a talk at this conference on internet programming in Python. And, you know, in the grand tradition of speakers at conferences, he's learning about CGI on the flight while he's uh, you know, having the <laughs> conference. He doesn't really dig the, the, the spec all that much. He kind of has some problems with it, and he thinks he can do better. So on the flight back, after the conference is over, he writes this package called Bobo, which was destined to become the, 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 the first web object publishing system. Now, Bobo, along with a package called Document Template, uh, which supported dynamic you know, creation of page templates and so on and so forth. And then another uh, package that was called Bobo Pods, which uh, ended up becoming the ZODB, it's an object database. These three packages form the core of what would become Digital Creations flagship project, product, this thing called Principia, which was a uh, commercial Python application server, kind of in the, the vein of JBoss or Tomcat, things like that. Um, in fact, it was one of the very first application servers in any language. Now, around 1998, the largest investor in digital creations uh, convinced this guy, uh, Paul Everett, who was the CEO at the time, along with you know, the rest of the board of the company, to release the Principia software as an open source package. Kind of a strange step to take, but they did it. And Principia became the Z-Object Publishing System, or Z-Object Publishing Environment, Digital Creations changed its name as a company to the Zope Corporation, and Zope was born. Uh, Zope Corporation was intimately tied, if you're not aware of this, to the early years of Python development. In fact, between 2000 and 2003, uh, our benevolent dictator for life, Mr. Guido Van Rossum, worked there when his company, Python Labs, became part of the Zope Corporation. Uh, in fact, a lot of the software development that happened back in these early days was really core in the development of Python, the language itself. Zope and, and Python moved together for quite a long time. And Zope was interesting because it allowed developers to build powerful applications entirely through the web. It lowered the bar to get started in web development. You could explore the system and learn experientially, right? So Zope benefited greatly from this easy on -ramp, much in the way that Python benefits from the fact that it's a relatively simple language to learn. If you don't need to learn a whole set of tools just to get started working in something, it makes it a lot easier to onboard people and get them playing around inside the system. And like Python itself, once you learned the system, it was actually really quite powerful and quite secure. You could build excellent tools with it. So it became something that people like to use a lot. Zoop was undeniably successful, and numerous applications ended up being built on it, uh, particularly to address the growing interest in managed content. Now, the most successful of these things was something that was called the Portal Toolkit, or the Content Management Framework. We call it CMF these days, and it was architected by this guy. His name is Trace Seaver. The CMF provided all kinds of really great tools to create content, to control the publication of that content, to set displays for the content so you can control how it looks through the web. You could add interactivity via user input, and then you could theme the result with uh, the resulting web application. But you didn't look at this, right? I mean, CFF, CMF wasn't really all that pretty to look at. It was kind of kind of kind of hideous, especially especially for non-technical users. You don't want to work in a system that looks like that, even in like 1998. Um, there we go. So in 1999, this guy Alexander Leamy and that gentleman Alan Runyon uh, were talking with each other in the Zope IRC channel, and it turned out both of them had kind of a shared interest. They were trying to figure out how they could put a kind of a theme on top of the CMF to expose the power and the simplicity of it to people who were normal, non-technical users. They wanted to create something that would let the average person interact with the system and create and manage content in a really compelling way. They created the package CMF clone in order to fulfill that goal. Now, 
they must have done a reasonably good job because after its first public release in October of 2001, Plum quickly gained users in mind share. Its most distinguishing feature was this idea that you could manage content in place in your website. What that meant was that you could have somebody surf across the website to the place where they wanted a page to appear. They could click a button and create a page right there. It would be private until they were done editing it. They could submit it for review. Somebody could review it and then publish it to the website. And they could do all of this right in the place where the content was supposed to be located. There wasn't any back end that you had to learn. You didn't need to leave the website's front in order to go and create and manage the content that you were working with. And the strong security model that Plone inherited from Zoop allowed for freely mixing internal facing and external facing content. So companies no longer had to actually create separate intranets and extranets. They could mix this stuff up entirely without having to fear that some of the stuff that they didn't want seen would end up being seen. Oops. Yeah. Yay! Like so before it, Plone ended up benefiting from this mix of being easy to learn but powerful enough for serious work. And the Plone community grew and the software grew with it. This is a, a, a photo from the 2006 conference. If you look up in the very back there, there's a little guy wearing a white baseball cap, and that's me. Um, and that was my very, my very first conference. Um, core contributors were growing. There were more and more people who were contributing to the software. And the collective, the Plone Collective, which was the place where we gather up add-ons and things like that that, we were, that that people create for Plone, had a tremendous amount of functionality. In it. There were all kinds of packages that did all sorts of interesting things. Chances were, if there was something you wanted a content management to do, system to do, there was an add-on available for Plone that would take care of it for you. But there was actually kind of a, a weakness hidden underneath this surface of strength. And the problem is that Plone and Zope relied heavily on the idea of subclassing classes, or using mix-ins to put things together. And each object in the system had scores or maybe even hundreds of methods and attributes that were available on it because of all of these mix-ins. And in addition, in Plone, there wasn't really a very strong distinction between those methods or attributes that were sitting at the top that you should, as a developer, feel ready to reach in and touch, and the ones that were down underneath that were core to the system that probably would be better left alone, or at least kind of dealt with through an abstraction layer. Add-ons that people created often ended up reaching quite deep into the system to use APIs that probably would have been better left untouched, and this caused problems. Moreover, because of the way that Plone and Zoop had this really strong support for doing through the web development, oftentimes users of Plone would make changes to core components of the software, and these changes would be resident only in the database. They'd only be part of the data layer. And the problem with this, of course, is that changes like this that are in the database, they can't be tested, they can't be versioned, and it's really difficult to write documentation that says what you changed and when and for what reason. And that documentation isn't resident anywhere near the code anyway, so it always ends up getting lost. All of the real practices that make software, modern software development, like rigorous and repeatable and, 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 and safe were not available to this kind of work. Now, for a time, this would seem fine. Your website would continue to work. You'd have all these nicely customized pieces. It was operating just the way that you wanted it to be. And then the time would come for an upgrade. And you'd press that button with the promise that the upgrade was going to go smoothly. And no, <laughs> things would explode. The, the changes in the system wouldn't become apparent, the problems with these changes, until you actually went to do the upgrade. And what should have been a smooth transition really didn't turn out to be so. The problem with this is that then something that was supposed to cost you just a few dollars in terms of an upgrade and a few you know, minutes or so worth of time would end up taking weeks to find all the problems, to fix them, and to make sure that things upgraded smoothly. And so the first cracks began to appear in the reputation that Bone had built for itself. Now, to the community, the solution to this problem seemed relatively clear. If making these kinds of untestable, unversionable, undocumented changes are causing these problems, then we should not allow that kind of behavior. It's something that we should prevent. Plone went into lockdown, and everybody who used Plone was told, from now on, you should only make changes in file system packages, forum responses, talks at conferences, the IRC conversations, everything really focused on trying to shift away from through the web development into file system mm -hmm. development. Development of the Zope component architecture around the same time allowed the community to focus on 
deprecating these kinds of through the web components, page templates and Python scripts and form controller scripts and so on and so forth, and begin to replace them with things like browser views and utilities and schema-driven form libraries and all kinds of fancy tools like that. At the same time, this is around 2006, there were big advances in Python packaging. This was around the same time that Setup Tools was created. And you know, those advances allowed for much more complex installation scenarios. You could really legitimately combine bunches of different packages together and have it work repeatedly. The Plone and Zoe communities went all in with Python packaging, really focused on trying to make sure that they were playing the game that Python seemed to be doing. Now prior to this, you can install an add-on into Plone by downloading a zipped folder. You can take that folder and unzip it into a magical product, products folder and restart your Zope server and boom, the thing would be ready for you to use. After this point, what you did was you took the name of the add-on that you wanted, you added it to your build configuration, you re-ran the build system and allowed setup tools to reach out to the network to pick these things up for you and bring them down. And most of the time that worked and it worked quite nicely. Sometimes it wouldn't, but you could generally retry again and get it to work better. The benefits to this were clear, right? There's all kinds of things that come out of this that are great. We get repeatable builds, we get reduced surprises, and we get modifications that live on the file system and have test coverage for them, they have versioning, and they have all kinds of really great documentation that comes with them. But of course, with the good comes the bad, and hidden in amongst all of this was something of a trap. Clone was originally designed for end users. Right? It's made to be easy to use. It's for content creators, it's for explorers, people who want to do exploratory coding, test things out, try it out in the web. You can install Plone, play around with it entirely in your browser, and build a really great website out of it. After this point, the end user experience in terms of content creation and editing and management stayed great. It was still wonderful and really easy to do. But if you wanted to extend the system, now you really had to be a programmer. There was a certain amount of knowledge that you just had to have in order to come to the table. And because of the complexity of the underlying stack, CMF underneath Plone and Zope underneath that, you actually had to be a little bit more than just a programmer. You had to be like a, a, a Plone program. You had to know a lot of things in order to get anything done. Now, the community decided that we could create tooling to get around this problem, right? We created command line utilities and through the web utilities that would allow you to answer a few questions and you would get out these package skeletons that had all kinds of pre-existing boilerplate code put in them for you and everything would be great and you could use them, but honestly, pre-generating a bunch of code isn't necessarily the answer to solving people's problems. It's kind of just a band-aid on a bleeding wound. And so, for most of the people who weren't already Plone developers, the message was kind of clear. Right? <laughs> we don't serve your kind here. <laughs> well, in reality, ever since these changes started to happen, the Plone community has been concerned about this problem. The hackability of Plone, the ability to get into it and explore and play around and try things out. This has been a big concern for people, and a lot of work has gone on over the years in order to try and address this. There have been dozens of packages and ideas and things that have been aimed at improving this ability to return to the sort of hackable clone that we all knew when we first started out. These packages were created in the collective. They've been released out into the wild. They're being tested by people who are using Plone over the past bunch of years. And over time, evolution has been at play in the collective. And now we have you know, a pretty solid set of winners that have come out of this project, process. There have been a bunch of technological advances that have really done very well for us. And Clone 5, which was released this October, almost 14 years to the date after its first public release, ties all of these advances together into one really fantastic, powerful, and modern CMS. For the rest of the night tonight, what I'd like to do is to talk to you about one of those packages. It's a core of our improved theming story. It's something that lets people really uh, make easy and simple themes for clone sites. We call it Diazo, uh, and it's the core of our improved theming story. But in order to understand what Diazo is and why it came to be, we need to take a step back sort of to the early stages of Plone. So, in order to understand Zope and Plone on top of it, you really need to understand this idea of traversal. The idea of traversal starts with a URL. Everybody knows this, you've all seen these things before. This portion of the URL is called the path. 
And everybody realizes that this looks a lot like a file system path. And our first websites, things that were served static out of Apache or, or something like that, what they did was that they walked across the file system following the stages of this file system path. When they got to the end of the path, they'd be looking at a file or a folder, and they would take that and return it as a piece of H as an HTTP response to the, the user who had requested such a thing. Maybe they would return 404 if it wasn't there. Now, Jim Fulton's idea and the Zoke concept was to treat Python objects in the same way, right? In Zoke, every object, starting with the root of the ZODB itself, is actually, it behaves like a Python did. And so, if you take that path and you treat the path as if it were keys in a dictionary, you can walk across this containment chain from one dictionary to the next to the next, and in the end, you end up with some kind of an object that you're supposed to publish. We can see this in process from some code from the early Zoke publishing system, right? On this line right here, you can see that we get an object by traversing across the request using a path. The object that we have in our hand is then called. This mapply uh, function that's being used right here is much like Python's apply. It has a little bit of extra security stuff built in to make sure that you're not doing something that you're, you're not allowed to do. But in essence, what it does is it calls the object, passing all the rest of that stuff as a, a series of arguments to that object. Now, for content objects then, when you make that call method, it would use this function here that we call get view for to find the correct appearance for that particular item. The method would check the name that comes in as the view up there, and by default that ends up being just plain view, against a list of actions that are supported by this particular content object. When it finally finds one that matches, well then it takes that action object, looks for an attribute of it called the action, and then traverses from the object that it has to that action. The key to this, if the action happens to be a page template, is that there's this object that's in the traversal path for all kinds of things, and it's called portal skins. What it is is a tool that puts together a whole series of file system folders, and those folders contain page templates. And those page templates result in the HTML that you're seeing when you look at a website. All you need to do in order to override a page template is find where it is in this system somewhere, and then make a copy of it that's different in a folder that's higher up that up higher. This is really similar to the way that Django page template loaders work today, right? You have a series of folders, the system goes and looks through them in a particular order, and the first one that gets found wins. So if you want to customize something, you just make sure it's found first. Now this was easy to do in Clone because in the ZMI, this backend system that Zoe provided, you could press that little customize button, and what it would do is take what was a file system page template, make a copy of it, and put it into this custom folder. And the custom folder was, by default, always the first layer in the set of folders that a particular skin is made of. Now, this is fantastic, but the problem is, is that that custom folder is only resident in the database. And page templates and other components like page templates have all kinds of pre-baked conceptions built into them. Right? When you render a page template inside some kind of a web publishing environment, there's a context that goes into that. There are variables that are available that the page template expects to be there. Maybe there are other templating macros that that page template depends on that are going to need to be there. And sometimes, during upgrades from one version to another, those expectations might change. Now, if the expectations do change, then the next time you upgrade, the world in which your custom page template is rendering is now different than the world in which it was created. The names that it expects to be there, the things that it's looking for are no longer present, and you start getting errors, you start getting problems. And those problems are difficult to find, they're hard to fix, and they become slow and expensive. This is not a happy situation. So the answer is clear, don't do that, right? We're not going to do that anymore. Plum developers decided to move away from page templates that were located in these portal skins tools and towards page templates that were associated with things that we call browser views. To understand the difference between these two things, we need to take a moment and talk about this Zoke component architecture, or the ZCA. At its core, the ZCA is all about interfaces. And an interface is a kind of a contract that specifies how an object is supposed to behave to the outside world. Any object that behaves in that fashion can be said to provide that interface. 
Now, the benefit to this kind of approach to programming is that the consumer of the interface, the person who's trying to use it, doesn't need to care about what happens inside those methods. It doesn't need to know the implementation details. It just needs to know what data needs to be provided and what's expected to come back at the end. This leads to decoupling, which makes systems much more robust and easy to work with. Oops, it went backwards, didn't it? For a real world example of this, I want you to think for a moment about a faucet. Okay, it's kind of a weird thing to think about, but faucets rely on a water supply, right? Every faucet has one underneath the sink. There's two little pipes that come out. One of them feeds you hot water, the other one feeds you cold water. In a certain sense, you can think about this as the interface of a water supply for a house or, or some other thing like that. Now faucets can use this interface to provide hot and cold water to you in a number of different contexts. Maybe it's a kitchen sink, maybe it's like a, a, a shower stall in a public uh, swimming pool somewhere, maybe it's like a cat hideout in your apartment or something like that. You know, all of these places use hot water and cold water to do their jobs. They all wrap around that same interface. And so we can call these things, in a sense, adapters. The sink, the shower head right, the, 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 the cat hideout. All of these things are adapters of that water supply interface. If you wanted to write up a system like this using Zoe component architecture code, it might look something like this. You make a few imports from the core CCA packages. Then we declare a couple of interfaces. The first one up here is our water supply. It has a hot and it has a cold. How are those things created? We don't need to care at this point. It's not important to us. Then we also have a faucet interface. And the faucet interface, you'll see, uh, has a run hot method and it has a run cold method, right? So this is where you actually use the water that's gonna come out of your faucet. Once you've got interfaces, you can start to implement classes that are gonna provide those interfaces. So maybe we have a house, and you see that the house implements the water supply. What this does is make a promise to the component system that hot and cold are gonna be attributes of that object. They'll be available to be used. We also have a thing called a kitchen sink faucet, which is gonna implement the iFaucet interface. Notice it has a run hot and a run cold method, which are the actual specific implementations of those methods. But also notice that this thing adapts a water supply. And what that means is that when you initialize one of these, you have to provide a water supply as one of the arguments. That argument becomes an attribute of the object itself. This is containment as opposed to inheritance. If you think about containment as an object-oriented program or an object-oriented programming uh, 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 approach, then adaptation is really just containment with a bit of like componentization wrapped around it. Now, once you've got all this set up, then we get this thing that's called the site manager. This is the, the, the place where all of the components that we have are registered and available to us. We register an adapter that's the kitchen sink faucet. We say that it's going to supply our water supply interface, and we give it a name. And then when we build a house, we can ask that house for the adapter that provides the faucet. If we tell it which one we want, the sink one, well, then it's going to hand back our kitchen sink, and then we can turn on the water and wash our hands or maybe clean up that kitchen, which would be a nice idea. Browser views, returning to the idea of where Clone went, are just adapters. They adapt an HTTP request, which is something that you're going to get from your client, and then a context object, something that's meant to be published. And they're callable. When you call them, they return some kind of string that's going to end up being sent back to the client as a response. In code, a simple view might look something like this. You've got a class. It implements the browser view interface. You can see that it's going to adapt context and request because those are the two arguments that are required for its initializer. It's also got this call method, and you can see that inside the call method, we're actually using request and context for the data that they contain so that we can send back a string that's you know, specific to the particular request that came in. In Plonin and Zope, you can register these things using a language called the Zope Component Meta Language, ZCML. And this allows you to hook up all of these adapters so that then they can be used inside the system. Once the registration is created, then you can traverse across the request, just like you did in that publication code we saw earlier, get a context object, and then ask that context object and the request to be adapted by some kind of a browser view. You provide a name, and what you get back is the view that when it's called, sends back the string that you're expecting it to send. This is a pretty interesting system, and it works quite well. 
these registrations can be specialized, right? This is a very generic looking one, but you can also specialize them. If you want to pass a page template to it, then that page template will get rendered when the call method gets called. If you want to say that I don't want to adapt just anything, I want to adapt a particular kind of content, well then you can specify that you're for a particular kind of content, like a document or maybe an event or a news item, which means that you can register for different kinds of content, different kinds of views. And getting even more specific than that, if you have an add-on, those add-ons can register layers and those layers will be attached to requests that come whenever those add-ons are installed. That means that you can make a view for the document that provides the my view name that's more specific than the default one. And when you run the system and go looking at that object, that's the one that you'll see. It's quite a nice little system. It's clean, it's decoupled, and everything works great. So in this system, we can specify how to build our website's pages by registering browser views instead of overriding page templates and skin layers. And that is testable and you can version it, and you can write really great documentation about how it works, and everything's groovy, except, of course, that in order to change the view of something, now you have to actually create a package, and you have to write a class, and you have to write a page template, and you have to register all of this stuff using XML. <laughs> Once again, the message is clear. <laughs> So after these changes were underway, some folks in the community started to think a little bit differently. They started to ask a really interesting question. Why do I have to override page templates at all? Page templates provide specific layout for visible data about content types, right? Generally, we've overwritten page templates in any sort of web system in order to provide different kinds of layout. Consider something we're gonna call a news item with some body text, a lead image, maybe it's got a contact. The default layout for it might look something like this. And maybe you want it to look like this in your system instead. And so if templates are in fact equal to layout, the only way to do this is to replace the original template with a new one that changes that layout around. But is this really the only way that things can be? Is it possible that layout is just layout? Maybe there's some way that we could transform layout from one format into another. And it turns out that there's actually a technology that's been around for a number of years that allows us to do this. We call the technology XSLT, and again, it's XML. <laughs> People get really excited about it. They're like, oh my god, you led us to this and it's XSLT. <laughs> And the plot developers were aware of this, right? Nobody wants to write XSLT rules, so we created this package that's called Diazo, and the theme of it is that we write XSLT so you don't have to, which is really nice. The idea of Diazo is that there are a theme and some content, right? There's a theme and there's content. It consists of eight basic simple rules. And the first one is this theme rule that indicates a plain HTML template file. This is going to be your theme, and it can be any kind of HTML at all. All the other rules use selectors to find HTML elements either in the target theme or in the source content. These selectors can be things like XPath, but if you happen to be like a designer who uses jQuery or CSS or something like that, you can also write CSS selectors, which are a hell of a lot easier and everybody understands and works with every day. This is kind of a nice thing. In addition to the theme rule then, there are other rules that allow you to do things like replace elements in the theme with ones from the content, or insert content elements before or after elements that are in the theme, or maybe to drop elements out of either the theme or the content entirely, including all the children inside them. Maybe you want to just strip a particular element out but leave its children in place. All of this is possible. You can also do things like copy and merge attributes from one element onto another, which is a really great thing. And in the end, what you end up with is source content. You lift pieces out of that content and stick it into the HTML that you've registered as your theme, and you're off to the races. Now, a theme then in Clone 5 looks something like this. You've got a page template file, a, a single HTML page that is your theme. Maybe there's more than one of them. You have a little bit of CSS and JavaScript that is used to uh, make that work and make it beautiful. And then you have this little rules file down here that you can write that picks up pieces of the content and plops them into the theme. You can use your own tools. 
If you have a designer that is a uh, grunt and sass kind of person, that's fantastic. If you happen to have people who use Yeoman, that's wonderful. You can adapt to the latest JavaScript thingy and the latest CSS frameworks because all of these things take place outside of Plum. Plum doesn't need to know anything about them. And that is fantastic. All you need to do is add a rules file to whatever your designers give you, and you're off to the races. I know, everybody does. <laughs> and if you use Diazo with other applications outside of Plum, and you can, either as a transform that lives entirely in your web browser or as a WSGI middleware layer, you have to write XML, you have to write these rules. But with Plum, you actually get a little bit more, and this is where things are going to get fun here. So for just a second here, I want to give you a quick demo of how this actually works. So I'm going to switch over quickly to this. Uh, which is now on completely the wrong screen. So I'm going to pop back here, mirror my displays, and we should have it up. Fantastic. Now we're going to come back in here. And in honor of our guest tonight, who's here, Mr. Brandon Rhodes, I decided that what I'd like to do tonight is play around a little bit with theming a clone site using the PyCon uh, website's theme. So before this evening started, I, I downloaded, I clicked on my little browser here and said, download this thing as a, a full web package. It gave me the HTML for this page and all the CSS and stuff that goes along with it. And I decided I could play around with that a little bit. So here's our unthemed clone site, all set and ready to go. And what I'm going to do here is stuff this in my pocket so I can talk into it and type. That would be fantastic. <laughs> all right. So what we're going to do here is we're going to come into this site. We're going to go to the site setup area. And we're going to click on this little theming button here. And we're going to upload a zip file, which I created earlier, out of this stuff. I'm going to go and choose that file. And here it is right here. And we'll say, import that puppy. And what it is is a nice little theme. You can see it's got index.html, which is all the HTML that came from that page. There's a little folder here that contains all the CSS and JavaScript and stuff that you uh, have from the page. And then there's this rules XML file down here. And that's where we're going to do our work over the next couple of minutes here. So let's play around with that for just a second. The first thing we probably want to do in here is we want to take like the, the, the navigation elements that are up here at the top of the page and replace them with the ones that are actually in our phone site. If you look at the original phone site, you'll see that it's got home news events and users, right? So what we're going to do is come in here and click on this little build rule button. We're going to build a replace rule. And we're going to click on next. And what it's going to do is ask us to pick the thing in the HTML mockup theme that we have that we're going to replace. So I'm going to hover over this, press escape a couple times so it climbs up to the container for all of those things, and select them by hitting enter. Then I'm going to click on OK, and it's going to send me off to my unthemed clone content, where I select the navigation item, hit escape a couple times so it selects the container, and then I'm going to choose to apply that rule just to the children of those containers, so only the list items that are contained inside them. I insert this little rule. It's built right there. And now I can go ahead and preview this theme. And you'll see we've got the Python website theme with our navigation inside it. The next thing we want to do is probably replace all of this content that's inside with the stuff that's actually in our phone site. So we'll come back over here and build one more rule just to prove the point. Another replace rule we'll build, and this time we're going to come down to our theme and we'll hover over this, press up a couple times so we get the container for all the stuff on the page. And then we're going to select from our content the title of the front page, and we'll hit up until we get to the container and select it, and we'll press to insert that. Now we've got a second rule that's been written in here. We can save the thing go back over here to where our little preview is, and reload, and the phone content is now appearing inside the PyCon theme. If we go then back to uh, the theming engine here, we haven't actually activated this theme yet. So our front page for our clone site still looks like it did before. Nothing has really changed over here. However, at this point, I can come back to the engine, go back to my control panel, and activate this brand new theme that I've written with two stupid little rules in it. And when I go back to the front page of the site and reload, we've now got a clone site that is sort of halfway wrapped in the Python theme. Now, it took me about two and a half minutes, maybe three minutes to do this. With a little bit more time and a little bit more effort, I could get much further than this. But I want to wrap this talk up before the end of the night. So I'm going to stop there for the time being. Um, so. 
That's Clone 5, or at least it's the beginning of some of the technologies that are making up Clone 5. It's our theming engine, Diazo. And Clone 5 provides a lot of other wonderful packages as well. Great features, interesting functionality. There's this thing called Patterns Lib that allows you to write simple HTML patterns, and when those things get rendered in the page, there's JavaScript waiting there to see them, and it will turn them into highly functional elements like image sliders, or drop-down menus, or select boxes, or folder views, all kinds of really fantastic stuff. There's a new content framework called Dexterity that allows you to create and manage your content types entirely through the web. But when you're done making them, you can actually press a button, get out a package that can be installed inside clone, any other clone site, and you can version it, and you can write tests for it, and so on and so forth. It's really quite a wonderful thing. Dexterity has this thing called behaviors that allow you to take aspects of a piece of content and apply them to other kinds of content. So let's say you run a site where you want to show people in town all of the hospitals in the city. So you make a hospital content type. It has a location, a latitude, longitude, and maybe a map that it displays. That could be a behavior, and then when down the road you decide you want to show them also the schools that are in town, or maybe the playgrounds, or other things like that, all you have to do is attach this locatability behavior to it, and they all get latitude and longitude mapping automatically by themselves. Because these things are done in a decoupled kind of way and not using subclassing or mix-ins or anything like that, the system works really well, it's easily testable, and you get wonderful functionality. We also have multilingual content. So Clone actually comes out of the box with a multilingual engine that will work for all the built-in content types and any custom content you create. So if you're interested in serving up content to people who speak languages other than English, this is a great way to do it. There's also a Clone API now, which has developed a bunch of abstracted APIs that are lifted up above all of those layers of complexity underneath us. So developers have a clean, clear interface to work against. Finally, there's a whole bunch more that I'd love to tell you about, but I'm running out of trouble. Now, this talk was called My Grandfather's Axe, and I want to talk for just a minute about why, right? Clone's been around for a long time. It's got nearly 15 years worth of history. It's my grandfather's axe. A couple years ago, the handle broke, I replaced that. It's still my grandfather's axe. Just last week, I was wanging on something with it, and the head shattered. I replaced the head, but it's still my grandfather's axe, and it's as sharp as ever. With Plum, what was old is new again. There's a lot of work that's left to be done. We have to implement Python 3 compatibility, and we're very interested in people participating in that process. We have the cleanup of all those layers underneath us. Zope and CMF have now, as of the last couple of weeks, been forked by the Plum community because we're really the only people who use them anymore. We're now in control of all of those packages, and we're working on trying to clean them up. There's a lot of really interesting work to be done in there, and we're hoping that some of you might be interested in participating. We've heard that there are a number of people in the Poppy community who are interested in contributing to open source projects, and I've been working with the folks who run the Thursday night Puppy programming nights to try and develop a program where we can help to mentor you to become a contributor to the Plone community. You'll be helped either by myself or by some of the other uh, luminaries of the Plone community who happen to live here in town. David Glick over here is one of them. Fulvio Casali is another one. Um, this is your chance to contribute to a program, a project that has a long and storied history and that has a lot of applicability in today's world. Plum is a great community. We know how to bring people on. We work in a tradition of sprints, and so we're comfortable onboarding new developers who've never seen the system before. We also have a code of conduct that applies to every event that falls underneath the Plum Aegis, and so we're a, a safe and welcoming space. We would love to have you be part of it. There's 377 people in the core contributors factor. Maybe about 40 of them or so are, are active and have contributed recently to Plone. But there's nearly 500 folks in the collective and almost 1,500 packages. It's a large and welcoming and happy community and active, and we'd love to add your name to it. I'm available to get demos of Plone on request, as are the, you know, the members of the Plone community. We're happy to see if it might be something that you're interested in using. Um, if you have decision makers in your company who are looking for new CMSs, Plone.com is aimed at decision making type folks. Um, I would like to give some quick thanks before we're finished here to Eric Steele, our release manager, who uh, gave me the idea of the grandfather's acts. To Paul Roland, who inspired a great deal of the speech. To Brandon Rhodes, who gave me the idea to give the speech in the first place. Um, and then to these folks who contributed greatly to the ideas that were expressed here tonight. All the mistakes are mine, all the good stuff is theirs. I'd also like to thank the puppy organizers who gave me an opportunity to come and talk tonight. 
Here are a couple of additional credits for those images that were too big to fit in the uh, credits on the screen. I would be remiss in not mentioning that Plumbing Conference is coming back to the United States here for the first time since 2011. I'll be part of the organizing, organizing staff for it. We're holding it in October in Boston. If you're interested, there will be trainings included in the price of the conference. Um, and that's my name and contact information. Uh, if you have any questions at all, I'd love to talk to you going forward about this or any other topics. Thanks very much for your time. Questions? Uh, you keep that microphone. Okay. I'll try and hand anyone else a question. The microphone that I have in my hand. So, if you have a question, raise your hand. Anyone? Anyone at all? Hey, oh Nathan, I'll get back. I'll kind of move your Hi YouTube. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so, how uh, modular is Clone? Like uh, you mentioned, patterns live. Is that something you can use outside of Clone? Is, are there any components that I can use without binding to the whole Clone stack? Uh, there are some components that are not part of the whole clone stack. The Diazo component is actually something that's usable completely outside of clone. Um, it's available both as a, a plugin for uh, Apache and Nginx, and it's also available as a busy middleware layer, so it's something that you can use to play with. Uh, PatternsLib is really just a bunch of, of JavaScript, isn't it? And so I think it is also usable outside of the clone ecosystem. Um, there are a number of other packages as well that are supposed to be usable outside. We, we did some refactoring at one point to try and make it so. Uh, I don't know how many of them are actively used outside of them. Anyone else? Um, I'm, I'm pretty good at Python, but uh -huh. uh, I haven't a clue. Where does the JavaScript come from? Where does the JavaScript come from? Well, this is web development. Right? And so JavaScript is now a growing and ever larger part of the web development world. Uh, Plone is really aware of this fact, and so we're trying to take steps to make it so that JavaScript developers who are interested in developing client-side functionality for their content managed sites can use Plone well. Uh, we're also working on making a JSON API, a RESTful API for Plone, so that you can interface with it from other systems like maybe React or, or Angular or something like that from the front end. So a lot of that kind of work is also going on. What type of system requirements do they have? Uh, Plone will run on uh, any sort of Starnix kind of system. It also runs on OS 10. This is, you know, the site I themed here was running here locally. It is also available, I think, in Windows installers. We have Windows installers that will make it run uh, under Windows, but most people end up doing it up in the cloud somewhere. It's not a lightweight system. It's got a lot of really serious functionality in it, and so it, it, it tends to take a, a, a slightly larger instance if you're speaking in AWS terms than, than something like a lightweight Django system. System, but it also provides a heck of a lot more. Any more questions? All right, all right. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Bye. Uh, I hope I haven't missed this, but uh, could you contrast it with Django maybe? Well, that's a great question. Django is a web framework, right? With Django, you're going to build web applications kind of from the ground up. Clone is a content management system foremost, which means that it comes already with a lot of really highly opinionated tools about content management. It's really going to expect that what you're building is a site that has a lot of different content in it of different varieties, and that the, the tree of content tends to be heterogeneous. You have folders with different kinds of things in them. You might have events and news items and so on and so forth. Because Clone runs on an object database rather than a SQL backend, because it's not a relationally built system, it tends to be a little bit more secure simply because it's not vulnerable to all of those kind of SQL hacks that a lot of other systems are. Um, but at the same time, it's also you know, a, a, a different kind of thing. So if you're accustomed to people who are, are thinking in a SQL sort of way, working with an object database is, is, is a slightly different thing. But it's, it's primarily, I would say, a content management system and not a framework, although it has a lot of framework-like features and you can develop extensions for it uh, uh, quite easily. All right, cool. I think that's all we have for questions tonight. Fantastic. If you have any more questions, Chris is going to be, I'm going to assume, hanging out. Absolutely. Break and all that. Yeah. If you have more questions, uh, talk to Chris. Chris, thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs>
uh, in case you're wondering, the bathrooms are back here, uh, down the hallway, and then immediately to the right past the door. Uh, stand up, talk to people you've never talked to before, socialize with people. If you are afraid to talk to strangers, come okay. All right, thank you for uh, showing up and staying after the break. We have two more speakers to tonight. We're going to start with Yusuke. Uh, Yusuke. Yusuke. I'm so sorry. Yusuke, he's a Zillow employee, he's a software engineer, he writes code. Uh, I'm just going to let him talk about uh, Uranium, which is an open source project. Uh, I'll let him explain it. He's so much better at it than I am. That's not true. Thanks, Alan. Yep, uh, once again, my name is Yusuke Tsutsumi, uh, and my talk today is about Uranium. Uh, it's a Python assembly framework, and we'll kind of take a journey together from small to large. Uh, so a little bit about me, I'm a software development engineer, uh, I work at Zillow, so thank you everyone for coming out uh, and hanging out with us. Uh, I work on the Velocity team at Zillow, and you might ask what is Velocity? Well, it's effectively anything related with developer productivity is kind of our concern. Uh, the steps between getting your code written on your machine and getting it deployed to production, if there's any manual part of that or any part that's slow, it's our job to automate that and make that quicker. I have about eight years of experience coding Python, and you can talk to me on Twitter, and I also have a website as well. So let's get started. Uh, I have a little scenario that I want to talk about. Let's say you're a small team of about five or ten developers, and you're going to create a new web service. Let's talk about some of the pieces that actually are, aside from the code, valuable. You depend on some internal packages, so let's say you have your own internal PyPI that has you know, specific libraries that help you accomplish your business. Uh, you have some remotely stored configuration files to run. Let's say there's some other pieces, like there's some JavaScript you need to compile, um, and you've got some unit tests to run as well. So now that you kind of have context on the situation, the, the question I'm asking today is, what happens in between getting from the source code and getting your service up and running? All right, there's a lot of steps in there. Uh, we need a system that kind of helps download dependencies. We need a system that downloads the configuration like we were talking about to figure out which databases it needs to communicate to. Um, and we need to make sure it's kind of consistent for everyone who works on this. Uh, well, I guess first I should start with the name. So what, what do we call a system that kind of does everything in between these two? Uh, the term I've heard around the environment is assembly system. Uh, so let's define it a little bit more just for the scope of this particular project. Um, what do we need from this assembly system? Well, we need an isolated dependency management. Uh, it needs to be reproducible, and it needs to handle arbitrary task execution. Chris is laughing at me, and some of the other clone developers might already know a project that does something very similar to this. And we'll talk about that. All right, so what is an assembly system for Python besides the clone people? <laughs> No, yep, no one else knows this. Um, okay, so here's a very, very simple example of one. It's virtual env, pip, and glue scripts. Okay, remember what we were talking about? The three requirements are isolate dependency management. Uh, virtual env provides isolation, right? Oh, and let me talk a little bit about why isolation is important. It's important because you don't want to have global dependencies that affect all of your services. If you've got two different services running on the same machine, it's important to make sure that those dependencies are separate because for example, if one version isn't ready to roll forward with a new version of Django or Request or something, you don't want to force that on every other service that's hosted on that machine. Um, PIP handles the dependency management. It effectively downloads the all of the libraries that we, that we need and all the libraries that those things depend on. Um, and then we have glue scripts for literally everything else. It's the arbitrary task execution of the piece. Um, in this particular case, uh, luckily, the service that we're relying on for configuration is dead simple, and we literally just do a curl or some sort of web request to download it. Um, and then at the very end, we run tests too. Alright, All right, so here's a chart. Uh, we've got our three requirements, and we've got kind of how this particular step satisfies all of that for us. Cool. So we have a system that basically satisfies all of our requirements for the time being. Uh, let's move forward and start writing some code. All right, so we wrote a bunch of code, and we drew a lot, and now we have a lot of stuff going on. We have more libraries that we work with, we have more services, 
And you know, some of our services have custom requirements. Some of our services have C modules that they need to compile along the way. Some of our modules have uh, binaries from remote services, places that we need to download. Um, like if you're testing with PhantomJS, for instance, you need to download that before you execute those tests. Um, and if you have a front-end system, you need to make sure you download like Gulp or Bauer or some sort of build system for those as well. All right, and you notice that kind of problems are building up with your amazing assembly framework. One, uh, shell scripts are kind of hard to maintain, um, especially for Python developers. It's not like, uh, it's not what we do with most of our time. And as a result of that, we're not very good at writing robust, testable bash code. And there's very few people who are. <laughs> but at the end of the day, we're Python developers and it's hard for us to maintain stuff like this. Uh, second part is there's no reuse uh, in this particular framework at all. So for example, let's go through some of these examples. How do I run code coverage globally? Or how do I, I say, I want code coverage on all my projects now. How do we include that? Effectively, the only way I can do that, given my current system of virtual and pip and shell scripts, is I have to go into every single project and literally add the dash dash code, um, also add the requirement of you know, PyTest cover coverage to every single project, and that's a lot of manual work. And I have to do that for kind of these other cases as well. Uh, what if we use a new technology to get configuration? It's no longer a curl, instead we're curling some other service, or we have to download some packages instead um, to download those. We have to, once again, go into every single shell script that we've written so far and do that. Um, same with a new JS build tool. Um, and how about some of the other stuff that goes on? So for example, uh, once again, the configuration infrastructure, if that changes, we have to go through everything. And uh, what if you want to kind of roll back the pin for everything globally? Let's say a new version of Django just breaks it, you were using some old deprecated API, and all of a sudden, new version of Django comes out, you're always pointing the latest, it breaks everything. Um, if you're ever working with a lot of services, you probably don't want to pay the cost right now. Um, so effectively, it would be nice if there's some way that we could just roll everyone back until we're ready to take on those costs. So what this kind of says is there's a missing piece of the whole system right now. Um, effectively, what handles everything outside of virtual env and pip? Well, uh, we need a system that basically is outside of that and handles the, the reuse aspect that we were kind of discussing before. We need to handle conflict management. And um, from what I can tell, there's really no consensus in the community for this. And there's some solutions that do exist, but it's difficult to use. And no offense to the clone people, um, but we have 60 Python developers, or we have people who develop, 65 people who develop Python full time here, and they have a lot of trouble, first of all, reading the documentation for build out and utilizing it as well. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, effectively, let's look at what our requirements are now in our new ecosystem where we're dealing with multiple services, multiple libraries, and we want to share infrastructure. We need a system that facilitates reuse. We need a system that provides configuration. And we need a system that effectively shares versions across multiple projects as well. And uh, we have this problem with Zillow, and effectively that's why uh, this project Uranium kind of came into the picture. It's also an assembly framework, or it is an assembly framework. It handles environment isolation, and the way it does that is under the hood, it just utilizes virtual in a programmatic fashion. Uh, it handles dependency management by, once again, using our uh, tool that already exists that does this very well, PIP, programmatically. Um, and it's a completely configured through Python code. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, it's got out of order. Blue scripts don't scale, but we know that already. All right, so uh, let's talk about what it takes to actually get set up with Uranium. There's uh, two different approaches you can have. One is effectively installing it globally if you want, or if you really, really want to push the whole isolation factor, you can download this Uranium standalone script that will handle the downloading of Uranium for you, creates a virtual M, sticks that inside of it, and then executes Uranium as well. The, the second piece of that is you actually have to author the configuration for your system, and that's where the ubuild.py comes into play. Okay, so here's an example of kind of what that looks like. On the left-hand side here, we have uh, just literally the top-level directory of any given Python project. There's two files, once again, the Uranium and the ubuild.py. And on this right-hand side here, uh, I hope everyone can read this, uh, it's the ubuild.py script itself, 
And effectively, what this is doing is you're defining a bunch of tasks for your Uranium project to be able to execute. By default, if you just run dot slash uranium, it's going to execute the main project. And we'll see in here that it doesn't really do a lot, but uh, it does kind of everything that our whole system did. We specify the requirements uh, either in here, or we can just open a YAML file or JSON file or whatever you'd like with the requirements specified. You spe can specify the package URLs uh, by effectively taking utilizing this build object. The, the build object is a portal to the current environment that you're executing in. Uh, one thing I should note about the way that Uranium works is effectively, when you run Uranium on a project, it uh, creates a virtual M if there isn't one already for your project, it activates it, and then immediately executes the script with Uranium inside of it. So what that means is effectively down here uh, on the download configs, if I want a package, I can install it with build.packages.install, and then immediately after that, I can import it and use that in my, build, in my assembly process as well. Okay, so going back to kind of the overall thing, we have, uh, we kind of have our specifying of a custom index internally. We can download our requirements one at a time. Uh, we can add multiple different tasks, and we can also make certain tasks require others. Uh, so for example, if we look at the test task, which I could run with dot slash uranium space test, um, I, it basically requires the main task first, so it will ensure that main is executed before test is executed. Okay. So, enough uh, slides, I guess. Let's take a look at a demo. It's actually a very short demo. Uh, so. That was fast. <laughs> oh, yeah. Totally. Cool. So, uh, there's a project here that I have called, called Yellow. It's basically a Django app, and all it does is keep track of kind of who's the best at ping pong as the yellow rating system for two for 1v1 matches. Um, and let's say I've cloned this for the first time, and if you don't believe me, I'm just gonna do a git clean xdf, blows the whole directory away, uh, except for the files that I keep track of version control. And let's take a look at the ubuild.py really quick for this. Um, so effectively, it's a very simple Django app, and all we're going to do is at the very beginning, uh, we're going to basically download all of our dependencies and run, and at the very end, we're gonna set the database if that's necessary. Setting up the database, uh, anyone who's used the Django app um, is probably familiar with manage.py migrate, and effectively, uh, when we, if we wanna start the service up for the first time, we run develop, which then literally executes the manage.py run server for us. Um, but basically, the bottom line here is that as a developer or as, or as a consumer of this, all I, I don't need to know anything about necessarily how this works or how it gets stuff under the hood. All I need to run is dot slash uranium. Can you your pod? Sure. So effectively, you just saw some lines at the top. It did the whole virtual initialization thing that I was discussing earlier, creates a sandbox for this, downloads all the packages, and then it also runs my migration process as well. All right, so I guess the question would be, is it actually going to run now? Let's find out. Cool. It looks like it just started up, so let's just double check here. And there you go. Sorry, I wish it was a lot more complex, but this is really all I have. As far as the demo is concerned. Okay, um, so you've seen the demo, but does it really fit the requirements that we talked about? Well, let's go over what those are again. Uh, the pieces that we validated so far is there's isolated dependency management and reproducible. Um, but what about these other pieces? Well, facilitates reuse, configuration, shared infrastructure, and handles arbitrary task execution. Let's take a look. All right. Here's the patterns for reuse as far as Uranium is concerned. You have two choices. Uh, this is the first one, the simplest one, which effectively, you've got your ubuild.py that you stick in the projects on the right. On the left-hand side, you've kind of got your base. This is your base uh, task file that is shared across all of your services. On the right-hand side, if, you, if there's nothing special about your application, there's really very little you have to do besides specify where the base, package, where the base task file is, and that's it. 
Um, it does have to be hard coded. And a quick note about this: be very careful about what you're downloading. This um, down typically downloading arbitrary things that get executed immediately when you you know finish downloading them is very dangerous. So you've got to trust your source. Uh, my suggestion is to host this internally somewhere uh, where a very small set, subset of people can manage this. Anyway, on the left hand side here, you've got these tasks that get reused. And effectively, the way that we tell Uranium that these are tasks, um, even though they're not inside of this ubuild.py file, is by this decorator build.task that we decorate onto this. Um, when you're running a ubuild.py, you can just assume build is a built in part of um, the, the global or local context that you're executing in. So very straightforward. Basically, what I'm saying here is I'm going to install whatever packages there right now in development mode. And um, if you want to run tests, I literally download the common testing framework that your system might use. And then immediately after, I call the sub process. And remember, this sub process works because we're literally in the, we've already activated the virtual end by the time we even execute this. Uh, you don't have to run source bin activate. Uranium takes care of the activation for you. So that's one pattern for reuse HTTP. The other one is, through, is eggs. And this is a pattern that you might want to consider once you're kind of farther along and you want to have a build a assembly process that's reproducible and testable. Uh, so effectively, very similar pattern. The only difference is you have to kind of specify the internal package repository that you're going to use if you're hosting this uh, privately. Um, so either way, you have to hard code one piece of your infrastructure um, and make sure that that's kind of up to date. Aside from that, you install the private package, you import it, and you immediately run the setup script. And if you look at the setup script, it's really no different than the one that we were talking about earlier. It's literally just adding the decorators, adding the functions, and making sure that people use the proper indexes, um, which actually in this particular case is unnecessary. But, all right, so we have reuse. How about the rest of this? Configuration, shared versions, arbitrary tax execution. Um, here's an example of how configuration works in Uranium. There's a global config object that is a dictionary, uh, should be a dictionary of strings to strings. And the way it works, is you just specify the value and you kind of grab it uh, and you can query it as you're working with it, as you're executing your particular task. So in this and the way that you specify that from the command line is by passing in this dash c. So dash c. So if I need to basically configure my package or my uh, assembly process to become the development mode, development mode including installing my package as a development library or utilizing the development environment, I just basically check the build.config. Cool. Uh, so that's configuration. How about shared versions? Uh, is that possible? Yes, it is. And the way that works is effectively uh, build.packages exposes a versions dictionary that specifies a bunch of version specifiers with the key being the package name and the value being the version specifier itself. Uh, this doesn't mean that you download these packages. All this means is that effectively when you do try to install them as dependencies, this will be folded into the, specif the version specifications of that particular package. So going back to the previous example, what happens if, for example, Django breaks um, or breaks you specifically? You just make sure that this is uh, added into your kind of uranium-based file, and you just roll back, and immediately everyone's saved. No one has to hard code that particular version pin into their package. All right, cool. So it's satisfied all these. Uh, how's about arbitrary tax execution? How does that work? Well, it's Python. At the end of the day, uh, it's effectively, you can use whatever you want for it. As we kind of described earlier, you can literally download packages and immediately import them and use them if you want to. So if you request this kind of your, your bread and butter, go ahead and download that, use that in your process. Um, as usual, Python's a great standard library, and people who are familiar with kind of like Make or Maven or stuff like that, you don't have to use um, languages or paradigms that you're not necessarily familiar with, it's just Python. Okay, so we've kind of walked through this, and within our particular set of requirements, we see that kind of Uranium can satisfy that. All right, so there's kind of the introduction to Uranium. Uh, a lot of people ask, is it ready? Uh, here's the facts. I'm going to try to state them as soon as possible. It's pre 1.0, which means that there are unstable APIs that we're kind of exposing through that build object that we talked about. Um, making sure that we're making sure that's documented as such. It's Python 2 and Python 3 compatible. Um, so if you use either, you're welcome to you can use Uranium. And uh, we actually do use it as a little for real projects. Um, I'll be honest and say we don't use it for literally everything. Um, but there are projects uh, underway to migrate that. And, uh, <laughs> what, do we use for, uh, what do we use for everything else? 
we do use build out for everything else. I should say that. Um, uh, we definitely like like we still like build out. All right. So uh, <laughs> okay. So here's how uh, you can help. I've been asked about that. Uh, please try Uranium. Effectively, at this point, it's gotten to a point where it's kind of solved within Zillow's process, um, but we really want to see what the community in general thinks. Uh, please give us feedback if this is a project, if you think this is something you're interested in. And, um, you know, it's an open source project and we're definitely open to people contributing and suggesting changes or design uh, suggestions as well. Okay. So that's Uranium. You can uh, get more information uh, from Read the Docs. There's a source available as well, which the Read the Docs point to, and you can find this on Pipe as well. All right, thank you. And if you have any questions? David. Uh, thanks, this looks great. Um, it's true that, that build out is, is hard to figure out, um, but one of the things that build out does is because the configuration of a build is declarative. Um, it'll compare the current configuration to the last build and it can figure out if there are tasks that it doesn't need to run again. Does this try to do anything like that or is that just not a problem that you're, that it's trying to solve? That is a great question. And actually, as we were designing this, it was originally declarative. Um, trying to do the exact same thing that build out did. And the decision that we reached was, effectively, it would be hard to create a system that's kind of agnostic to that, besides literally just seeing if it ran or not and trying to make decisions off of that. So as of right now, we didn't have a good pattern. We didn't even try. Uh, we didn't even try to do that, so at least for this particular presentation. So if you have good ideas on kind of how to do that in a way that can still maintain the sort of imperative flexibility that we really want from a system like Uranium, um, I'd love to hear it. Thank you. Cool, awesome. Yes, in the back in the green. Uh, what do you get from Uranium that you don't get from something, for example, like Puppet or Chef or Ansible? That's a great question, too. Good. You're getting all the questions that I was hoping people would ask. Um, so, a lot of people do this with their particular deploy process where the deployment is also the compilation or basically getting the application ready for deployment as well. So a lot of people will basically do a Git clone um, or do a Chef deployment as well, and basically their deployment process is tied directly in with the provisioning process. Um, you can make that choice, but at Zillow what we found was the only way you can truly be 100% uh, uh, what do you call it, determinate about your system is by creating a binary package or something very close to that and effectively just dropping that on the system and executing it. Um, and that's kind of what Uranium is designed for. If you know, Chef up with an Ansible, and effectively you can tie those two pieces, of, uh, those processes together are okay for you. That's great for us. We needed a, we needed a story that would give us quick rollback if necessary, um, and because of that, it's really important to us to have a process that's so flexible that we could literally stick like the provision or compilation part into a binary package that we can then extract and run immediately. Uh, right there. Uranium has no current opinion about the right way to do that, um, mainly because uh, those of, we haven't really had a good consensus on what that pattern is. So that's, once again, one of the things that we really want help on is kind of making decisions about you know, what's the abstraction that will be useful enough to the majority um, to include that as part of like the, you know, the base framework. Yeah. And sorry, I've got one question over here first. You uh, mentioned regression a moment ago. Um, if you build something and put it in production and it doesn't work, now what do you do? Uh, our current process at Zillow is effectively we have both versions deployed on a single host. Um, in the case where things don't work, we immediately shut down the one that wasn't working and we switch a symlink to the more version that was working. Um, there's other deployment processes, and I don't really want to say that we have like the best in the world. There's other deployment processes that have a very similar pattern for this. Um, but for us, we found that this was one of the current implementations of our system, so we needed to build something that was conducive to that. 
I have one last question. What license? Uh, what license are you using and why? Go. Uh, MIT, because honestly, we didn't really want to be bumped out with licenses. <laughs> Yeah, Conda does do that, um, and if like this is kind of an interesting thing. If you look at the virtual and sort read the docs, they also have a similar tool to kind of what Conda is, the analog to Conda for just pure Python packs, which is virtual and wrapper. And they take a different approach to things, where effectively you as a developer manage the environments that you work in, right? Effectively, we want a system where the the, the project itself manages its own environment, and you don't have to worry about oh, I have to create this Conda that then basically expands these particular packages, and I work in that one exclusively. Um, I don't know enough about Conda, so maybe Conda also has a system that basically lets you specify the requirements, and it'll do that in isolation. Um, yeah, uh, but one other thing, another reason why Conda wouldn't necessarily work in this, in this scenario is um, we really like the fact that Uranium is completely imperative and not really restricting you from having to, you don't have to build a binary, another package to then consume that in the build process, right? If you're experimenting with the way that you download something or the way that you want to work with, uh, the way that you want to like effectively stitch your process together, you're not kind of bound to first having to build this package and then executing it first. Um, so for rapid prototyping, it helps a lot, um, but once again, but we kind of want a framework that provides both, right? Um, that's why the sort of HTTP slash egg pattern exists. First, you kind of iterate as fast as possible on the HTTP side of things, and once you kind of feel like that's good, that's when you kind of finalize that into an egg as well. Um, so I'm not saying Conda can't do something like this. I'm saying that it's, um, for us, rapidly iterating was kind of important, so that's why we chose to do this. Um, sorry, do we, have, do we have time for another question? No. Okay, I guess that's a no. So we can definitely talk afterwards. Okay. All right, thanks a lot. So our, our final speaker for tonight is someone that uh, if you've been writing Python for any period of time, you've probably heard of, or, or, or not, I'm not sure. <laughs> How many YouTube videos you watch, uh, or if you've ever been to Python, or not. Uh, it's Brandon Rhodes, he's a software engineer, works at Dropbox, uh, he refused to give me a description, so uh, I'll just leave you with that. <laughs> <laughs> Is this mine? Yeah, you can use that one. I'll take this one, sure. Great, do you like this one better? No, they're, they're the same to me. <laughs> All right, let's see if the laptop uh, projector are as happy as they were a few minutes ago. X, R, and R. I always use the um, Command line tools because they never fail, unlike those those crazy little things where you try to drag the screens and you're like, where did my PowerPoint go? People are always saying that. GUI? Are you talking about a GUI? Yes. Oh. <laughs> those things. When you undock from multiple screens and come into a one you know, screen presentation. Where's my presentation? It's over here. Where's the OSX? You get two pixels on the left. Oh. That must be with uh, Yosemite or, or Maverick. Uh, yeah, I was trying to kind of have this. Okay. So that makes sense. I haven't, I haven't experienced any of that upgrade yet. I still have. Uh, I upgraded the other day and it broke. And then I had to go on a proud of it. So, yeah, I'm not oh, oh good grief! <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's a good idea. Yeah. Ah, I, keep the old I won! <laughs> <laughs> like three I thought I was going to show only half the slide. All right, uh, so I'm Brandon Rhodes. I work at Dropbox, uh, and uh, uh, I'm able to be here because we have. I happen my uh, group was working out of the um, Seattle office, uh, the 64th floor of, of some Columbia thing. Was it called what Tower? Yeah, Columbia Tower. Columbia Tower. Tower. We kind of look down on you from there. It's, it's very, very, very tall, very high. Uh, the Space Needle is utterly uh, underwhelming from the 64th floor. 
Uh, and uh, and anyway, I am a volunteer chair of Python 2016, right down the road in Portland. And um, we are not we have, we're not yet sold out of tickets. So if any of you weren't doing anything over um, Day is it Memorial Day? Yeah. That's, yeah. Over Memorial right. Day or the two days subsequent, yeah. uh, the conference will be down at the uh, Oregon Convention Center on the east side of the Willamette uh, River. Uh, so, uh, having gone full time at Dropbox after uh, several freewheeling years of setting my own schedule and consulting, uh, and accepting volunteer responsibility for PyCon, meant that my my open source projects have, have kind of stalled. And I realized that I should speak this evening about one of them in the hopes that since I might not finish it anytime soon, <laughs> one of you might go write the same thing. So I'm going to talk about the, um, it, it works, I, I use it, but, but, but several parts of it are still kind of stubbed out. Uh, the testing framework that I started uh, conceiving of a year ago and, and wrote enough of that I've been able to use it, uh, but I realized that uh, I wasn't going to be able to finish it and get it into your hands anytime soon, so I better just describe it so that it at least can inspire, if not actually be useful. Um, how many people here has, have ever used a testing framework? How many have used a testing framework in another language? Uh, besides Python. So, uh, great, a, a, a crowd, a uh, number of you have, have used testing frameworks in Python, and a um, number of you have used them in other languages, I guess I should ask. Um, unit test. A dozen hands went out. Um, nose. Pi, yeah! Pi dot test. Okay, that's not all of the hands. What other testing framework have you used? Or was that all the hands and I just can't take the union of three groups of hands in my head? Huh? Django Test Runner. Django Test Runner. All right, we'll get off this subject. Because then the next he'll make some fun thing I have yeah. All right, so um, I, I realized, after years in the Python community, that I can't stand our testing frameworks. And uh, it was so painful to use them that I decided to you know, try my hand at writing one of my own. And so uh, tonight I'm going to kind of describe its inspiration and uh, how, uh, when it's in the mood, it works. Um, it started, uh, even though as you'll see I, I went uh, a bit farther into the question than this, I started with the question, why, as I run my test suite, does that first crucial test failure, that exception that comes up, that is gold, it's the thing I need to think about next. If only I can pause and read it and see what's gone wrong, I, I can begin the next bit of work I need to do, which is just fixing the test. But with most existing test frameworks, what is the first thing that that crucial piece of information does? It scrolls right off the screen. Um, and if you're using a very slow system, you might actually have a moment to read it before it disappears. Uh, integration tests help the exception stay on the screen longer. If you use a real database instead of a mock-up, more time to read the exception before it disappears. The, uh, the community knows of a number of anti-patterns we could recommend if you want more time to read the exception. But if you've done, if you've been writing fairly fast unit tests, the exception is gone. And yes, I know, you can control, you can control C, uh, the tests, and try to get them to stop. You can hit pause on your, um, terminal. You can set your terminal where if you scroll up at all, it stops uh, scrolling and, and, and simply <coughs> accumulates the additional output. There are workarounds for being able to stop the boat and get off and read the exception that's sitting in front of you. But the point is, there are workarounds. I realized that I've been fighting for years. I had all this little muscle memory to stop so I could read the failure. Uh, that was all based around the fault that all testing framework frameworks have the wrong UI default. 
What you want to do is stop and read. What they want to do is keep going. Uh, they usually, um, so, so the timeline that you're facing is, uh, I hit save, and that hopefully kicks off my test, so I see what the line of code I just wrote does. Uh, there's some amount of waiting I do, and then the first useful moment that I could be working is when I finally can get to work on the test failure. Any noise and any habits and gestures and things that I need to do between step one and three are to me uh, more or less wasted. Uh, existing frameworks tend to present you with a dilemma. You either have to wait for all tests to finish and you wait and wait and wait and finally the terminal stops moving and you can scroll up and see what happened. Or uh, most frameworks, because of that problem, uh, they give you uh, an option that will just stop and die right on the first failure to keep it on the screen and stop it from moving. Problem is you lose information. There is a class of things I can type that break one or two tests. There's another class of things I can type that pretty much break them all. And knowing that fact, well, did I just break this one instance or did I break everything, is actually for me really useful. Like the kind of error I look for, syntax error or not, for example, uh, is largely signaled by, well, did one test just fail or did my whole board just go red? And if you're stopping at the first failure, you don't, you don't find that out. You don't know whether you're, the test failure you're looking at is isolated or whether it's part of the whole family of 30 features that just die because you, you flip something the wrong way. So I don't find uh, either of these uh, very attractive. And so um, I started kind of rethinking the UI of my testing framework from the ground up. Uh, I decided to call the experiment that I was writing um, a say. So we mentioned earlier there are testing frameworks in Python and testing frameworks in other languages. The result of this is we're kind of running low on names for testing frameworks. <laughs> um, it, it actually took a bit of an afternoon to come up with a name. Uh, this is an old word uh, for uh, back, especially when in medieval times you would try to mix gold with cheaper metals to have gold coins that actually hadn't cost you as much to make. Uh, to assay a metal was to test it to see if it was a good quality. Um, and the, uh, my idea from just the UI point of view was this, that it would start up and act like a normal testing framework, start running my tests and print all those little dots to the screen, you know. Have you, have you ever seen one of those test driven development people at a conference? They sometimes just have like a black t-shirt with a field of green dots with OK at the bottom. Uh, like that's, that's just, that's, that's what testing frameworks do. They turn your successes into dots. And so I wanted that. I wanted it in a normal case to print lots of dots. But on the first failure, when it prints the exception, my testing framework is better because it stops scrolling. Magic. Um, instead, it, it just keeps reprinting on the bottom line, uh, reusing the bottom line of the screen over and over to show you that your tests are continuing to run and let you see if there's lots of uh, failures or errors or mostly things passing after that initial failure. Um, and then, in case you want to start hopping down, because the first exception isn't very informative, there are some keystrokes you can use to, even while the tests are still running, go ahead and be browsing and, and hopping up and down in your list of errors to see them. But until you ask, until you hit J or K to start moving through the list, the default is that it's going to leave that first exception frozen there so that you can, even before your suite is done, be going ahead, understanding that first failure, and hoping getting moving again in your coding. But this is my initial idea. But there's a problem, it turns out, with writing testing frameworks. Once you solve one problem, you start thinking, well, why don't I solve them all? <laughs> and so, um, this UI, I, I, I really liked it. I kind of, I kind of set it up. Uh, another thing you fix is, is exception tracebacks are kind of noisy and difficult to read, so you start playing with those and making them kind of minimalist and easy for the eye to pick things out. You can see here uh, that after this initial failure, hundreds of other tests ran and it just kept 
updating that bottom line without moving the screen anywhere. The, um, here it finally finishes and it gives me a tally. Apparently whatever I did was one of those kills lots of tests things. Um, but you see how this lets my eye both stray down here if I want to know how the whole suite went, but focus primarily on what, uh, in this case, went wrong. Uh, and so I was very happy with it. Um, but something interesting happened. I now, for the very first time, had an efficient test recording uh, sort of user experience. Once that was efficient, once that was very fast, once I wasn't sitting around waiting, uh, I started to notice how much time the other parts of my testing framework were taking from me. It's almost because before it was taking so long to run tests, I would check Twitter, I would check email, I would go look and see what his, someone, oh, someone said something in the Slack channel, right? A lot of times you don't feel delay because you enjoy it. Uh, you get out of your flow, you get off of the subject, you look at something else, and then you come back, the tests are done, and you can scroll up and down. Now that I had a way for the result to come back in a useful form rather quickly, and for me to quickly browse through a growing list of exceptions as the test ran, I found that and, and, and Amazon has numbers on how human attention span works. They, they, they made some of those public, you know, every tenth of a second you lose this percent of the people that were about to go to that age. Uh, and the same thing happens when we're doing software. There's a certain threshold you have depending on how well fed you are, your mood, the time of day. There's th some threshold below which you'll stay on the problem at hand, above which you're on tweet deck and aren't going to be back for like two minutes. And uh, one of the great um, uh, things that we have to do is, as uh, uh, I think knowledge workers is being aware of what tends to get us off task and trying to shorten those loops because I actually find it much, much more pleasant to just stay on a problem and fix it rather than leaping away over and over again and then having to build my state back up and, 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 and remember what I was doing when I get back to the window where the tests were running. So now that I was seeing the exception fairly quickly, I started wondering, well, why am I having to wait so long for them to start running? Once they were up and running and hit the first error, I could immediately look at it and get to work. So I now started to notice the time it took me to get to that point where that first few dots appeared and I knew that my tests were underway. I normally, in the, my shell or something, would write a little while loop with this command inside. Um, you, there, there are today very, very efficient uh, mechanisms, mechanisms built into modern oper operating systems where you don't have to pull uh, modify times or something to see when an editor can save. You instead can just ask the OS, hey, watch these directories for me and wake me up when anything changes. Uh, typically, the events you want to look for are not a write to your file. That, it turns out, is utterly disastrous because when you hit save in your editor, what most editors do is they truncate the file back to zero size, write one block at a time or, or whatever, they rewrite new contents, and then close the file once it's full. Well, if you trigger the start of your build on the first write to the file, you run Python while there's still half a Python file there. Okay, and let's be honest. Python is actually slow enough at starting that the editor will win every time. But if you're doing other things, running other compilers or uglify steps before using your JS or something like that, you will sometimes get glitches if you're immediately when you see a write happening to a file trying to use it. Instead, you want to wait for uh, a close of a file that was open for writing or for a uh, file name to be removed because some uh, editors instead will write the new file somewhere else and rename it. The disadvantage of that being if you've done funky things to the inode like setting for weird POSIX permissions your editor doesn't know about, it wipes them out and it removes the old file and moves the new one in place. So you have kind of there's this uh, different editors choose differently. You get atomicity if you write to a temporary file and then in one instant reading it into place. Uh, but you get persistence of inode numbers and of weird uh, properties you might have given a file if instead it truncates it and rewrites it, the danger being that it's not atomic. 
If a program happens to look while your editor's in the middle of saving, it will see half a file there. Anyway, um, I mentioned that so if you're not interested in testing, you got something out of this talk on, on like more of an OS, you know, actable file. Um, I always try to do that. Try to do that in talks. Throw in like tidbits for people who are going to get nothing out of your actual subject. <laughs> the, uh, so normally I have some sort of little tool, uh, a shell script that's sitting here, and as soon as I save and then my editor finishes writing a file in one of the directories I'm currently developing in, uh, over in my terminal window, the tests rerun, so I can just move my eyes over, and by the time they're there. I would love to have the exception up that I now need to work on, but normally I would look over it, it would be like restarting the, the testing framework. So in order to uh, tighten that up, in order to, uh, to understand where that delay was coming from, I put together a kind of mental picture of what I'll call the testing cycle. This is uh, not testing from your point of view, the person uh, who has to understand and fix the problems, but just from the machine's point of view. It doesn't know what's going on, it just knows that you edit a file, it has to run the tests. You edit another file, it has to run the tests. You edit another file, it runs the tests. That, that from the machine's point of view, is what it's doing as you're uh, doing test-driven development. And the basic steps in a uh, Python web framework, web framework a testing framework, uh, our first, there's some amount of delay as you uh, start up the Python interpreter. It has to load, it turns out, a lot of files, and uh, parse, uh, you know, it has to load up os.py. Every time you run Python, as so though it's never seen, that's not true, it loads the py file, but like, like it discovers, look, there's an os module, let me load it and uh, does this with dozens uh, or hundreds of, of modules, depending on how you have it configured, and that takes some certain amount of time. Uh, by the lower right uh, part of the circle, I, I'm then thinking of Python is up and running. You now need to import third-party libraries. You might be using SQL Alchemy, you might be using Pandas, you might be using NumPy, SciPy, Django. There's some code sitting there probably had a touch since you installed it that needs to be freshly parsed and loaded in order for uh, your own code uh, to be able to run. Uh, then your, your actual PY files, the modules that you're sitting in and editing will need to be imported and only when all three of those stages are done will a few fractions of a second or seconds or tens of seconds uh, get to be used running your tests. Again, I call that the testing cycle. Bringing up an interpreter, loading up the third-party libraries in your own code, and then running your tests to see whether they succeed or fail. Once I had this sort of middle model and had broken down of what was taking time and why I was sitting and waiting every time I could save on a file while nothing happened in my terminal window, uh, I started to dig into these different pieces and think, well, could, could these sort of be skipped? Could these be avoided? Could these be fixed? Uh, for example, starting with Python interpreter. That's kind of useless, right? I mean, um, it, 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 it's, it, in this case, it, it, I, I at the moment have a, a, a very hefty um, development grade, uh, developer grade laptop. Uh, on my uh, little travel laptop, I, I carry the smaller conferences. This is considerably worse. Uh, here, it only takes about uh, 30 milliseconds for Python to do nothing. If you're curious about all of the I.O. Python does in order to run no code, you can, uh, at home, you can try strace or I believe Trust on the Mac and see on my system it takes uh, over a thousand system calls for Python simply to start. See that I have given it no code at all to run and shut back down. Uh, Small enough delay, though, it's probably not noticeable, but it was the first delay. So I wanted to think through how we might uh, stop it. How, we, how might we avoid the startup cost, cost for the Python interpreter? Well, I stared at this, this cycle, and I thought, why am I starting it at the top? Why is sitting there with the tests having run, 
but Python not yet being restarted, why should that be my resting point between testing cycles? I mean, the Python, Python's going to start up exactly the same way after I hit save as it would right now. What if I just made having the Python interpreter up and running afresh and ready to do something be the position that I sit with my engines idling in? watching for that file to change, watching for me to get saved in my editor, and why don't I start from there? And it turns out this was quite possible. I just had to, once I was done running the tests, exit Python, enter it again, start it up, and then hold it ready to go while it waited for me to get saved on one of my files. Now, but again, uh, on most modern hardware, that's not a very long process. What about this next step? importing third-party libraries. This is a more significant delay. On my uh, very hefty developer-grade laptop, uh, it can take anywhere from tens, uh, uh, tenths of a second up to almost a full second to import something like a modern data library, that is something like Pandas that pulls on you know, the whole range of NumPy and SciPy kit tooling in order to operate. That is a lot of delay to wait to incur until after I've hit saved, and I'm sitting there looking at a blank screen, waiting for that first exception to appear. And so we can simply, it turns out, why not just go ahead and import all the third-party libraries? Your testing framework should notice that every time it imports your library, Pandas gets imported. Your testing framework should you know, go ahead and, and notice that every time it runs your code, SQL Alchemy gets imported. And the next time, when it has, you know, 10 seconds because you're busy editing and there's nothing much for the CPU to do, it should go ahead, get that fresh copy of Python that it's run, and have it start importing all of those third-party tools so that when you hit save, that uh, second of importing Pandas is already over. Pandas is already in memory, and only your .py files still remain to be loaded. And the savings at this point is beginning to add up. Um, a, a second of delay you know, only increases fractionally the chances that I'm going to wind up in TweetDeck or Facebook or something like that. But as Amazon will tell you, it is still a several percent difference. That repeated over and over through the day is not just saving me a second every time, though it is, it's also saving me from that fractional chance that repeated a thousand times a day is a lot of time on Facebook, that I will get distracted and go somewhere else because I'm steering at a terminal that isn't doing anything. All right, well then, you've got to import the code that's going to be tested, got to import all the PY files. Well, why wait? It's not like I'm going to edit all of them, right? <laughs> I, I never edit five files at once. I always edit one or two. So can't we move this arrow forward? Um, so this picture, where we uh, are holding pattern, our holding positions at the bottom, uh, we're kind of waiting to import all five, and this is a simple picture, A through E, all five of the modules under test. I mean, what if I just started importing modules in the hope that it will save me time? I could import A, B, and C, wait for the edit, and then import D and E. And I would save even more milliseconds. I would really start to get to the point where I hit save, and instantly, before my eye can track over, test results are already spilling into my terminal window. Oh, but wait a minute. There's a danger. What if I didn't happen to edit D or E? What if I edited A instead? What if I added a new module to the directory? What if A imports E? So importing A just imported all five of them, and the testing framework wasn't expecting that. When you get into actually going ahead and preloading some of the code that's under test, you're moving into very dangerous territory where, what's the penalty? You might have to throw everything away. 
You spent all this time starting Python. You spent 0.8 seconds loading handles. <laughs> and it will all be for nothing, and you'll be back at square one. How in computing can we make speculative imports safe? Well, we can use the same mechanism that we always use when we want to do something speculative that might not quite work out. They do this in banking all the time, right? You move money between accounts, so I need to add money to one account, subtract from the other, but I can't, I can't let that become real until I'm sure both succeeded. We need transactions. We need a way to have process-wide transactions where I can say, import pandas, okay, now freeze. Remember where you're at, let's go import something else so that I can back up in case I import something I shouldn't have, something that got edited when the uh, editor finally gets done and the person hits safe. And uh, so I need a mechanism that has transactions, and it turns out modern OSs have exactly such a mechanism. Uh, it's extremely cheap because it's done at the hardware level. It doesn't even copy the page table, I'm told these days. Uh, it simply reuses it for the new process. There's a call called fork. You, it, it, you make that call from inside of a process, and it says fork means make an identical copy of me so, there, so that there are now two. And, and it actually it, it is an extremely cheap operation because initially you're secretly behind the scenes sharing all the same memory. It's only as the two processes now have histories that diverge that the OS on demand has to copy any pages that you're changing. So, in order to put this at the surface of a transaction mechanism, I just needed two easy steps. One, I implemented a uh, transaction system using a stack of child processes. Parent process, whenever it's imported something that it doesn't want to lose, it says begin a new transaction. The child process forks a copy of itself, and that original copy is left pristine. It's sitting there having imported pandas and nothing else. I then can tell it to import SQL Alchemy. And because I don't want to lose that time ever again, I can say, let's begin another transaction. So that now waits forever, pristine, and I start a new one. Over there, I can do things like run my tests, um, load in other modules, and when I'm done and want to just back up to exactly how things looked, what I, you know, I imported pandas and SQL Alchemy, I just say roll back, the bottom child process exits, and I'm back at exactly what this pristine process uh, image looked like, and I can fork again and start over. I have a perfect transaction mechanism that I can stack as deeply as I want. Uh, how fast is it? It comes out on my system to uh, a, a, a say just to, to know how fast the mechanism was after I read, uh, wrote it. There's a little module you can run that will benchmark it. Uh, I can create a new process, have it uh, do a little work just to prove it's, it's there, and then uh, exit, uh, returning control to the parent process, uh, about 1,700 times a second. So this probably isn't something I want to do, say, for every test, so boy, it would provide isolation, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, how do I decide how many times I want this to happen a second? Usually what I do is I divide in my head um, by a uh, hundred, and huh, I, I apparently did that in such a hurry when I wrote the slide that I left a zero on. Why a hundred? So you might say, wow, I can do this a thousand seven hundred times a second. Let's do it a thousand seven hundred times a second. Problem is you wind up with zero time to run your tests. When you come up with a clever mechanism that can work in times a second, I usually divide by a hundred and think, well, if I do this 17 times a second, I'll only be burning 1% of my processing time on this cool feature. Maybe I'll notice that instead of running 100 tests in a second, I only run 99. But I think 1% is, is where I try to keep the overhead cost of something like a framework. Um, with 17 transactions a second, you have a dozen or so places in this process once Python is up and running where you can stick a transaction and have a place to fall back to if a change is made where you weren't expecting it. Uh, once you have the transaction mechanism up and running, 
testing framework just needs to continuously learn the dependency tree. Because depend you know, modules, they depend on each other. Um, they're, as I have to say, they're a directed asynchronous graph, but that's only if the developers are good people. Usually they're a <laughs> directed cyclic graph. Um, but you get, you get problems where if I just naively try importing these in alphabetical order, thinking, okay, I'll import each of them and, and start a transaction in between each one, so if I edit one of them, I only have to roll back that far. The problem is going to be that import main necessarily imports everything else. Great, I only got one transaction. I either keep it all or throw it all out when that edit comes through from the editor. Uh, so the testing framework, what it say does, is it keeps changing up the, well, experimentally, if importing main brings a bunch of stuff in, next time it'll just experimentally Try loading one of those other modules first in case it happens to be independent. And over time, we'll actually learn which order to load them in to provide the most flexible number of transaction points between the imports. And again, the point here is to just have a lot of flexibility so that when I hit save and it turns out it was this file that I'm editing right now, uh, the minimum amount is lost as you pop those processes off and now quickly with me sitting there staring at the terminal expecting something to happen, have to live import these while I'm waiting and start up the tests. Uh, now, I should note, uh, it, I, it, it was completely false when I pointed and said, oh, the problem is that you could edit one of these, because of course the problem is that you can edit any of it, right? Uh, in fact, these are just files on disk that could be edited too, as is the standard library. Who here has ever edited the standard library to add a print statement to solve a problem that you have? A venerable, venerable debugging technique. You're not only editing your own code. You could edit the pandas code or install a new version. You could edit the standard library. While developing a say, I edit the say itself. And it has to detect that throw everything out and completely restart the framework. So in fact, um, your testing framework should always be learning, not just about your modules, but about the third party modules in the standard library, so that whatever crazy edit or replacement hits the file system next, it has to do the minimum amount of work to get the tests re-imported and running. Uh, and so I'll just finish by, uh, the, these are the features that really excited me. And I'll just finish by listing the other kinds of fun things that you add if you're writing your own testing framework. The big things that, that I like about say is this ability, thanks to stable screen output and speculative importation, to have the minimum number of milliseconds transpire between where I get saved and when I have a useful result on my terminal, and then keeping it there. Bye. You start noticing other problems with testing. Here's a few more things I did. I added testing functions because everyone does that, but unit tests because everyone is awesome. So just like in Nose and Pi.test, you don't have to write a class. You can just write a plain function that's test in the name or at the beginning of the name that will be assumed that it is a test. Uh, I went in and added a cert introspection so that if you uh, just write an assert <coughs> statement, it will be able to look inside and see what the values were that failed the test that you set up since asserts are not uh, very useful otherwise. The problem with assert introspection is it's traditionally slow. The reason that pi.test on one system I use takes 50 seconds to import all of the modules is because it doesn't let the C parser that Python has parse them. It parses them with a special Python program it has inside of it that instruments the assert statements. I don't like waiting 50 seconds every time I start the tests for them to start up. So instead of instrumenting all code in import time with a custom parser, um, after a test fails, I go rewrite its bytecode to instrument the assert statement and then rerun it. So that's a little hacky, but it is vastly faster. It's made me much happier than waiting for uh, every Python file to be parsed on input. Um, 
But that's not, but that's not necessary. Obviously, that's an orthogonal decision I made to the, the uh, other technologies here. Uh, all right, since in order to get those transactions, I had to create this idea of a say stays up and running because these child processes that go run the tests, I go ahead and start as many of them as I have CPU cores. I might actually, I might actually uh, subtract one from that number because my editor becomes slightly unresponsive when <laughs> the tests are running. But the point is, you shouldn't have to ask for parallelism on a modern machine. It should just happen by default. A lot of the say's design is I just want something that does the best thing by default so that I don't have to go and learn how to turn basic features like parallelism on. A test framework should always alert you to dangling PYC files if you have removed the PY file. Who would even write a testing framework that doesn't do that? <laughs> have any of you guys ever been bitten by a PYC file? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then finally, testing fixtures. This could occupy another uh, uh, few minutes, and I won't. I will just say that. I can't use test fixtures in any other framework without looking them up and cutting and pasting from the documentation. They make absolutely no sense. In a say, a test fixture, you can make a generator. You just, uh, it, when you write the test, you give it a, um, an argument, and so a say goes and looks in the same namespace for something else of the same name. If it's a generator, it gets run, and for each value, the test gets executed. Or if the values are static, you can just have a list. Uh, so the first pattern I have seen for uh, fixtures that you can just learn and write without having to look it up each time. Stable screen output, speculative importation, of course, test functions, fast assert introspection, auto-parallel processing, dangling PYC detection, and simple test fixtures. Almost at this point amounted to a testing framework that I enjoy using. Thank you very much. a problem where we have five files, uh, like five things that you're testing, and you probably magically create uh, save points at every file. So let's say you did test one and two, and then moved on to three where the problem comes, and then you fix that. But if there is a case, if, can there be a case where file four uses two and three, and the four was working fine for the, the, the import that you did for two, and now since you edited a three, it gave you a temporary fix, uh, which would work for that category, but can that induce an error in number two? Which so, give you so a true, but does it answer your question to say that at the moment, all of my tricks are just to get me to where I've imported everything. I always rerun every test whether I think I need to or not. I never try to skip running a test, and I believe with the scheme I'm always running the tests against the most recent version of every file on disk. Does that answer your question, or might not? I think I, I got that the first time. Um, okay. But what I'm saying is, uh, if you change things on in three, can that give you a false true? And if you just, you started it from the beginning again, it would have given you a wrong answer, like uh, another problem. Like, like, like through magic, like opening the file and looking at it, or stuff like that? No. Um. So, with, if this, so if this doesn't import these, well, even if it does, you're fine. I'll probably have to have you describe the problem. That as far as I know, if I can get to here and import this, 
and then someone edits it, so I back out to a version of Python that doesn't have that imported and re-import it, it will find exactly the state of the world that it would if I just tore down Python and start it all over again. I think. It's worked for me so far, I'll say. Um, let, me, let me try again what I think he was asking for. So you, you go to the third module, yes, that one, and it opens up a file to write. And then something goes wrong and it gets backed out, but that file is still open for writing because you forked it and there's a second file descriptor that's, I'm not sure I'm getting this right, but I think you've got two file descriptors pointing to this open file and I think they get into a race. I, I may not understand the, the nuances of forking. And, and so, so, so one, let me say that no testing framework solves the problem of IO dependencies where uh, tests are touching a database, touch it, tests are, or, or modules in import time, if they're written by bad people, are touching files and changing things merely by being uh, imported. Um, Side effects are very difficult to deal with, and sometimes doing a git uh, clean of the directory. And uh, I, mean, I have in my uh, little testing framework here, uh, I, I do have a, um, uh, I, I do just, if you just hit R, it completely exits Python and starts everything over again because there can be weird effects where something you left on disk or have open persists because you don't quite understand how SQL Alchemy handles database connections or things like that. Um, but I'll say that in general, um, there is not a problem with the mechanism that I described of having files open. You're correct that when I fork, a file that was already opened here remains open. There are now two file descriptors. But I, are you asking if they share a file pointer? Whether, whether that might be moved ahead and thus not be in the same state when you come back? They, they do not share a file pointer. Each process has got its own file pointer. And um, now here I'm going back to Unix uh, internals from two decades ago. There is a field in the inode called a reference counter. Yes, which is maintained by the OS, not by... Uh, and, and so as far as I know, because the parent process does nothing but await and does zero I.O. or operations of any sort until the signal arrives telling that the child is dead, I believe I escape all the typical problems with interleaved I.O. Because in the code, the parent literally does nothing after forking uh, except wait for the child. It doesn't touch any of its file descriptors or change their state. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, I'm going to go home and code this up in C and test it. Go let me know if you find any interesting edge cases. Yes. Uh, I mean, I had Stevens at my elbow uh, <laughs> as, you know, as I, I, I made sure I was, was doing the fork with the correctly. I have not yet run across any problems, but I will say that I tend to write my tests where they don't do I.O. I'm one of those people that tries to write unit tests that don't do real I.O., um, either through dependency injection or through um, uh, the way I architect my software. Uh, uh, if you watch my talk on, um, what was it called? It was years ago. Uh, it was in Dublin. Anyone remember? Something about <laughs> software architecture? The clean architecture in Python. If you'll uh, watch that talk, it's a set of techniques I use for trying to keep I.O. out of most of my code that's under test. So I have not uh, used this scenario in a lot of situations where import time I.O. is happening and leaving files dangling. The results could be very interesting. If, if one does go inspired, but one doesn't want to start from scratch, will you be releasing any of this? Uh, it's on GitHub, yes. And has been for a year. No one's looked at it. What, what, so what, I decided to get it on. <laughs> what license is it? I think I do MIT because it's shorter. Yeah, it's, it's shorter. <laughs> well, and also, yeah, it's, it's yeah, simple. It's it, is that also Python's license? 
I don't remember. I think for stuff I'm doing for the Python ecosystem, you know, with a huge debate between BSD and MIT, I tend to just go with whatever tool I'm building on top of. I like Apache, but it's longer, but it's also it covers a lot more, and it also includes patent protection, which is nice. But MIT's great. Can't play. Yeah, you have a cocktail. What? The cycle. Yeah. <laughs> it's very popular. So I'm glad it took time to draw. <laughs> so when you're writing the tests, are you watching for any changes to file while you're writing your test suite to say yes because because yes. So if in the middle of the test suite running, the parent, the master process gets that signal that a file has changed. It immediately cancels all outstanding tests, rolls things back, and does its normal thing of starting over again. Because otherwise, you'd have to wait. <laughs> and, and if you can tell, like, the whole point of this is <laughs> not to wait. All right, uh, last question. All right, I hope I'm not wasting this time there, because it's a beginner question. Because we seem to have a personality trait in common, which is impatience. Which makes it even hard to write unit tests to begin with. <laughs> so how do you find the balance between what to test, like one plus one equals two, those kinds of tests? I can't. I just can't make myself do it. <laughs> um, I, I, I think my um, I think my general approach is I will test each code path once. And then if I can tell, if I'm worried that, you know, if I can't just tell by looking that the code will work correctly if the input's an empty list, if I can't quite tell that the code just obviously will work if the input is a negative number or something, then I'll also write a test for that case. So in general, I write tests that are the hand testing I would do anyway. So I don't really feel I'm slowing down. Because I, I can test the code with an empty list one way or another, if I just do any code, I get to keep it. Um, and then, so, so as long as the, as long as functionally, I've handled the spot check one or two edge cases, as long as I have a test that hits the main code paths, I consider myself done, and I generally let my users find the other cases which should be tested. <laughs> I always, when I get a user bug, the first thing I do is write a test that reproduces it, because for me, being impatient, wanting to make progress, the great problem isn't that my software has bugs. It's that I never want them to happen again. So yeah, I, I do, uh, unless it's a, unless, yeah, I mean, it, for very valuable software for a big client, I might write a lot more tests. But I just tend to spot check that stuff works because I'm impatient. And if I don't, my next attempt to add a new feature will break six old ones. And it's much faster just to be instantly told that than to spin out a new version of my astronomy software and have a user have to tell me that a bunch of stuff that used to work no longer does. I think she was part of the third of the audience that didn't actually raise their hand when you asked about test frameworks. <laughs> I bet those people just, they just don't have tests. <laughs> I'm, I'm often part of that uh, group. So uh, thank you, Brandon. So that's it, we're done. Uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, thank you, Zillow. A round of applause for Zillow. <laughs> After party tonight's gonna be at Vaughn's. Uh, it's like right down the street. If you don't know where it's at, just follow me or someone else who knows where it's at, just ask. Just, I'm sure like some of the audience knows. Uh, meet y'all there. If not, see you next time. We also have PD program tonight, so another event. Thank you. Oh, yeah, no, I think <laughs>